Well, Park Cities, it is an honor and a joy to be with you this morning. You are part of an incredible worldwide Baptist family of 49 million Baptists. You belong to a Baptist family in 128 countries and territories. Baptists from Australia to Azerbaijan, from, uh, from Taiwan to Texas, from Peru to Park Cities. And this summer, you played a key role in the 22nd Baptist World Congress. Thank you for being a Congress anchor who helped make it possible for Baptists from around the world to gather together in worship, mission, pastoral training and the defense of the persecuted. Parks Cities, as a Congress anchor through the delegates, this summer you helped touch 75% of the nations of the world. Believers who came together such as Abdullahi in Somalia. When Abdullahi was a nine-year-old boy, he had a dream. And in that dream, a voice said to him, follow me. My name is Jesus. He awoke and he gave his life to Jesus, but unfortunately, it took him six years to find a Bible. Unfortunately, his family found him studying that Bible and turned him to the authorities. And at the age of 15, he was incarcerated for his faith. So I asked him, I said, well, what was it like to be put in prison as a teenager for your faith? He said, I don't, I don't like to remember those days because they were filled with pain and with suffering, with beating and with torture. So I said, all right, well, was there a Bible verse that you held on to during that time? And he said, yes. I held on to Matthew 28, 20, where Jesus says, I will be with you always to the very end of the world. And as he clung to that promise, as he proclaimed out loud that promise, even while they were beating him, two of those who tortured him came to him in his prison cell and gave their life to Jesus Christ. If you have your Bible, would you turn to Philippians chapter four? As Baptists, we believe we are to be disciples living according to the scriptures. We believe the word of God is powerful and alive. It is conscience and conviction. The wise have studied it. The ancients preserved it. The faithful have died for it. The persecuted treasure it. The humble proclaim it. We believe the word of God is dangerous. It upends and overturns. It brings high and it brings low. Reformations have grown from it. Revolutions have sprung from it. New life emerges from it. The word of God is powerful and alive and it calls us to share in some good trouble. For the word of God is good news to the poor to the marginalized, the rejected, the downcast, and the downtrodden, to the ones in famine, those in prison, those trapped in war and conflict, to the stranger, to the refugee, to those who cannot see, cannot hear, cannot read, the word of God belongs to you. The word of God does not belong alone to prophet priest or king, but to every man and woman filled with the Holy Spirit, the word of God belongs to you. And Pastor Jeff has been leading us through Philippians, this word of God, and we reach the end of Philippians chapter four, beginning in verse number 12. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any in every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want, I can do all this through him who gives me strength. Yet, it was good of you to share in my troubles. Moreover, as you Philippians uh, know, in the early days of your acquaintance with the gospel, when I set out for Macedonia, not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving except you only. We will focus on verse 14, yet it was good of you to share in my troubles. The great 
Baptist pastor, U.S. representative, and civil rights leader John Lewis is well remembered for his famous invitation to get into some good trouble. In the face of complacency and the reality of injustice against the tide of apathy versus the mountain of violence, when it seems as if the whole world is turned against you, we are not to settle but to get into some good trouble. And in that statement, John Lewis is building upon what Paul writes in this verse. Now this invitation is built upon a powerful promise. As Paul invites us as believers to get into some good trouble. The promise he offers is the promise of contentment in Christ. Wouldn't that be wonderful? In a world with so much materialism and consumerism, wouldn't it be wonderful to have contentment? And Paul writes that it is possible, but only as we recognize that contentment is not contingent upon our comfort. It is only as we accept that contentment is not contingent upon our comfort that we are freed to follow Jesus into an adventurous discipleship. Whatever our circumstances, when we trust in Jesus, when we follow Jesus as our rabbi, as our teacher, it is possible to find contentment. Comfortable circumstances are a blessing, but our greatest joy and our highest kingdom calling will be found when we locate our contentment in Jesus rather than in our circumstances. I think about a Baptist leader in Syria named Haya, a mother of four. Did you know that there are nine Baptist churches in Syria? A radicalized group swept through her community, one winter snow blanketed the ground as the insurgents took Haya and her family, along with the other residents of the building, into the basement. Some of the men were immediately killed. After three days, those who remained alive were expelled into the winds of winter, and Haya and her family found refuge in a nearby apartment. It was so cold, she said, that our feet stuck to the ground, and after two weeks they were surviving by rationing for food one olive per person per day. Scarred by this shocking experience and filled with spiritual longing, praise God, they found a Baptist church. And as Haya described sitting across that breakfast table, even though I lost everything, I gained Jesus Christ. When believers allow Jesus' presence to be enough, we can hold two seemingly contradictory truths, contentment in the pursuit of sharing in some good trouble. The promise of Christ is not resolution of all our problems, reward on this earth, or rescue from all our painful circumstances. Rather, the promise is that whatever the circumstances, we can know contentment in the presence of Christ and the presence of Jesus is enough. Or we might reverse it. Paul's testimony is that when he did have plenty. It did not lead to contentment. When he did experience resolution, rescue, or reward, Paul testifies that these pale in comparison to the contentment he found in Jesus. And I want you to know that contentment. With Paul, my testimony is that Jesus Christ set me free When I gave my life to Jesus, I was changed and I found contentment in Jesus. If you confess with your mouth and believe with your heart that Jesus is raised from the dead, you can know the peace of salvation. 
And as we find that contentment in Jesus, it frees us to join Paul in an even more compelling vision than personal comfort, to stand in the problems of pain and in the grace of Jesus, share in some good trouble. It was good of you, Paul writes, to share in my troubles. Now, the Greek word for share here in this passage is not a common word. Sug koinonia is used only three times in the New Testament, but it's built upon a far more common word, koinonia, a close fellowship. But here with this prefix, it is the idea to share in, to be connected to, to associate with, to participate in. It was good of you to be connected to and to participate in my troubles. There are times when the scriptures teach us that we are to flee even the very appearance of evil, yet here Paul is teaching that there are times when it is good, when it is right, when it is the calling of the believer to join into hardship, trouble, and difficulty. The only other times Paul uses this Greek word is in Ephesians 5, 11, have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. As believers, we should not share in the causation of trouble and injustice. Do not be an originator of trouble in the lives of others. Do not join into societal structures that are good for some, but cause trouble, difficulty, and injustice for others. Whether structural or personal, do not be causative of unjust difficulty. Rather, Believers in Christ are to take two steps. First, we are to expose injustice. And second, to participate in, be connected to, associate with those who are experiencing the injustice of an unjust difficulty. Do not participate in justice, but also do not flee it. Expose it and join with those who have experienced its impact. We are to share in making some good trouble. Now the Greek word for trouble is more common with 45 uses in the New Testament. Elsewhere this word is translated as distress, trial, hard-pressed, suffering, persecution. We might understand this passage as saying it is Good, when you stand alongside, participate in, and share whatever you have with those who are suffering and in persecution. The New Testament and expanded translation writes it this way, you did a beautiful thing when you made yourselves fellow partakers with me in my tribulation. It is good and beautiful when you share with those suffering and injustice and persecution. So can I ask, how are you doing so? My wife Amy and I have three young children. They're a wonderful gift. And I don't know about your house, but we find ourselves saying words like these far too often. Share. You need to share. Is that good sharing? Have you shared? It's often not easy to share, is it? To intentionally give of our resources, to let go, to release, to choose a smaller level of comfort or even discomfort, to consider our priorities, our resources, our time commitments. It is difficult sometimes to share. And Paul encourages us to not only share in the troubles near us, but to share with someone geographically far, 
to share with those who may not be of the same language, culture, ethnicity, or station in life, to recognize we may be the prayerful answer to someone's pain, even as it is difficult and inconvenient. It is to recognize that my rights are not as important as what is right in the kingdom of God. To choose to place ourselves into painful realities, to no longer hold on, but to share with gospel generosity. It's why we are to move not only from closed hands to open hands, but to crucified hands. For only crucified hands can embrace the pain and the suffering around the world. Only crucified love can turn the kiss of betrayal into the birth of hope. In Jesus, only crucified hands can join into the pain of injustice and persecution on a journey of resurrected repair and restoration. And with crucified hands, we are to share and some good trouble. Friends, I want to tell you when you do so, there is life in the midst of death. There is powerful hope in the midst of pain. There are testimonies in the midst of tribulations. There is Jesus in the midst of journeys. There is discipleship in the midst of these difficulties. Now it takes time and it takes perseverance, but with Paul, I want to invite you to follow Jesus into a journey of incredible discipleship and to share in some good trouble. Where do you begin? Well, let's consider what Paul writes in this passage. He identifies himself first as a gospel worker on the faith front line. And in a world with three billion people who are still unreached with the good news of Jesus Christ, there are still many living on the faith front lines. I think about a woman I met earlier this year in Germany. You may remember that in July, historic floods swept through Germany, claiming many lives and devastating many communities. In August, I had visited several of those communities and had the privilege of having lunch with a church planter and and an older woman in her 80s who hosts a church planting small group in her apartment. This woman lives on the third floor of the apartment building and the whole street had been devastated by the flood. And as the waters were raising in her apartment building, she, she was praying until she had to evacuate and go higher up into the apartment building. This woman is the only believer on her floor, the only believer in her family. And when she came back down, she discovered that all of the apartments on her floor had flooded except for hers, there was not even one drop of water in her apartments. It was a miracle. And as the other residents returned, her neighbors told her that she must really be a person of God. And then they asked to know about this God who saved and rescued her apartment. And as she gave this testimony, she just radiated passion and joy as a woman in her 80s sharing Christ in this time of trouble. And she ended her story with this question, would you pray for revival? And that our small groups will be faithful to live in this moment as a missionary witness before the door closes again. I'm so grateful for Baptists who share the gospel. In the last 10 years, the worldwide Baptist family has grown 29%. Praise the Lord. Now, this is different region by region. In the last 10 years, the Baptist family in Europe and North America has declined 3%. In North America, it's declined 6%. But in the last 10 years, the Baptist family in Asia has grown 20%. In the Caribbean, 48%. In Latin America, 41%. And in the last 10 years, the Baptist family in Africa has grown 134%. Whether in our neighborhood or among the nations, every Baptist is called to be a witness. And so many of our witnesses are doing so in times of great trouble. It's why the BWA formed a strategic partnership with the 21 Wilberforce Global Freedom Center. 
and their incredible work standing among the persecuted around the world. I'm grateful to David Nelson, the chair of the Strategic Partnership, who is a member of this great church. Often beyond the headlines, Baptists live out their faith in the midst of trouble, and we are called to share that gospel journey with them. One such place is Myanmar. Earlier this year, a military coup overthrew the democratically elected government of Myanmar. There are 1.7 million Baptists in Myanmar, and last year, Baptists there were the second fastest growing Baptist convention in the world, a growing church facing a brutal crackdown. And Baptists are not alone. Rohingya Muslims had already experienced genocide, and now the military began dropping aerial bombs onto its own civilians. Peaceful protesters were shot on the street. I was on a call with the Myanmar ambassador to the United Nations who shared that the average age of those who were killed peacefully protesting for democracy was 17. In March, a convoy of 15 military vehicles with 60 soldiers arrived at the theological seminary there at 10.45 p.m. They went door by door looking for a New Testament professor who had denounced the military. Fortunately, she escaped into the jungle, but with tears in her eyes, she asked, will the international faith community raise its voice For the victims, she is asking, will you share in our good trouble? Your BWA family has been involved supplying emergent food, supporting pastors and leaders, investing in health clinics, raising up prayer champions, church awareness weekends. We've raised an advocacy voice from Washington, D.C. to the United Nations and countries from Romania to Brazil to Australia, but so much more is needed you can go to the website baptistworld.org slash Myanmar and join in this effort today. And just this year, Denmark worked to pass a law to force pastors to submit their sermons to the government. Baptist ministries in a Middle Eastern country had their bank accounts seized and a court declare that evangelical Christians should not be recognized as a faith community in that country. Cuban pastors arrested and imprisoned. Christian leaders in Hong Kong forced to flee. Women in Nigeria abducted out of the worship services. And to every one of these, we have responded. So let us share in some good trouble as we live out the gospel witness around the world. But Paul continues... Verse 12, I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry. Hunger is a powerful force from inner city Dallas to around the world. And structures can enforce conditions that overextend hunger. Poverty does not discriminate, though discrimination influences poverty. Non-livable wages, underemployment, the structures of societies imbued with an ethos of comfort and security can create conditions where hunger festers and where entire segments of our brothers and sisters live in chronic hunger. And what do the scriptures teach? Romans 12, 20 If your enemy is hungry, feed him. Share in his trouble. Matthew 25, 35, for I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. Share, participate in, associate with, connect to those who are in this trouble and to the structures that cause hunger. We are invited to expose them and share in some good trouble. One out of three Baptists around the world face significant hunger challenges. One out of four Baptists face persecution. One out of five Baptists face ongoing war and violent conflict. And we will continue to respond to these troubles around the world. But at the BWA, we have this radical vision of addressing the reality of hunger, of sharing in this trouble. And it begins at your table. We all have a table, 
Our tables may look different, but every one of us has a place where we eat. Can I encourage you, your table can be a kingdom mission. We can all use our table not just as a place to feed ourselves, but as a place to welcome those in the trouble of hunger and share with them, identify with them, be relationally connected to them. This church has many wonderful ministries, but this is not about a program. It's about your table and asking the Lord to sanctify our tables as a sacred place to share with those who are in the trouble of hunger. It's not about a closed table or an open table. It's about a crucified table. We all have the ability to live with a crucified table that welcomes one another with a shared meal. Verse 12, Paul writes, whether living in plenty or in want, or we might say whether living in plenty or in poverty, let us share in some good trouble. COVID-19 is forcing 47 million women and girls back into absolute poverty. There are as many refugees today as at any other point in the last 70 years. One out of every four Baptists in the world lives on an average salary of less than $2,000 per year. There is a need for literacy coaching and partnership with our local schools, outreach to prisoners and their families, refugee ministry and micro enterprise grants. I think about Lena Lavanya in India, one of our BWA Human Rights Award recipients, sometimes called the Baptist Mother Teresa. After hearing a sermon that ended with the hymn, I Surrender All, Lena decided to do that, to surrender all. Lena and her parents began to fast once a week and to use the money that they would have spent on breakfast to, uh, to, buy, a, to buy a sewing machine. They gave that sewing machine to a woman who'd been trafficked into modern day slavery and with that sewing machine came freedom and a future with a hope. And that was just the start. Since then, Lena has opened schools, homes for lepers, and ministry to adults and children living with HIV and AIDS. Lena has changed the lives of tens of thousands of people who were among the poorest in all of society. And it started when she answered this question, will I surrender all. The question is, will we? Is this easy? No. It literally has the word trouble in it. It's not easy and it's not common. In verse 15, Paul says, no other church entered into this kind of partnership except for you, the church in Philippi. So what if Park Cities is the only church engaged in this way? Paul might say, it's worth it. Come and share in some good trouble. Well, what if we are the only person? What if we are the only family that chooses to live this way? What if we don't feel able to live up to this kind of discipleship? Well, Paul connects this crucified generosity on behalf of those who are facing trouble with a far more well-known verse of Philippians 4, 13. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. The promise of Jesus' presence the discipleship that chooses to share in the troubles of this world is a journey in which Jesus will strengthen you. Jesus will give you what you need so that you can share with those in need. This is what Jesus did. While we were still sinners, Jesus left heaven in order to share with us his presence, his mercy, his love, his strength, the abundance of his riches, and now we too can do the same. Each in our own home, press in, using your crucified table as a base for mission. Each church in its own community, in Park Cities you're already doing so much, from the colonials to vicary to reconciliation among various racial justice initiatives, press in, and share in those troubles. And every church, joining hands with brothers and sisters around the world, share in the witness of the gospel, share in hunger, share in persecution, share in poverty. For in the end, this is the invitation. Will you share in making some good trouble? Let's pray. 
Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have called us to a life beyond comfort, to a life that finds contentment as we share in some good trouble. So would you take our hands, our crucified hands, and use them, Lord, for your glory. We thank you for this church, their skills, their gifts, their passions, their ministries, and we ask, Lord, that you would multiply in them and through them that they may live with crucified hands that share in some good trouble. In the name of Jesus, amen.